Let's begin our vector calculus course with the introduction of a field. There are basically two types of fields: scalar fields and vector fields. You can take the example of this temperature field. This scalar field or I could say a scalar function associates a scalar value or a magnitude to every point in space. For example, at origin temperature is 100 degree celsius. Similarly at this location temperature is 97 degree celsius. This scalar field only shows temperature reading at every possible points in space. Now if you multiply this scalar field with the vector operator then what you get now is a vector field. More basically a gradient vector field. This nabla operator here isn't really a vector it is rather a differential operator. It plays significant role in vector calculus. As you can see this is now a vector function and it has both magnitude and direction. If you remember from calculus 2 a gradient vector always points towards maximum increase or decrease of a function. Looking at this gradient field at each point in the region it gives the direction for which the increase in temperature is greatest. In this case the vectors are pointing towards origin. If you notice only on origin the temperature is maximum. So the temperature gradient at origin is zero. You can verify this by looking at the scalar field. Before we move more intuitive meaning towards gradients. Notice the difference between scalar and vector field. We would encounter a lot of vector fields in this course. Yeah, I have plotted a scalar function in space. Gradient of a scalar function is a vector that always points in the direction of greatest increase or decrease of the function at a point. The gradient operator here captures all the partial derivative information of a function, adds them and makes them a vector. Let's get in depth of it. Okay. Here is a function of two variable which I have plotted. It creates a hill in 3D space. Now, here is a boy standing at point A. Now he wants to climb the hill. and move towards point b he knows that he can climb the hill in many ways and can follow different curved path but also he wanted to climb faster so right now he is in search of the path that has the steepest ascent do you have any idea from a to b how can he get the direction to steepest path well he can use gradient It can shows him the path of steepest ascent of a hill. By using his position coordinates, he can generate gradient vectors. The gradient of this two variable function is this to the vector field. Let's plot this gradient field on every coordinates of our hills. These gradient vectors doesn't make any sense right now. Well, these gradients vectors are second dimensional. and makes much sense when you look them with the top view this is the path taken by our boy looking at this field graph you can see everywhere in hills coordinate the gradient vector points towards the path of steepest ascent yeah the gradient arrows are red in color and have larger magnitude it means that this area got the highest steepest slope Also notice here is no gradient the slope is zero which means the ground is completely flat So we calculated gradient of this explicit function but you can convert it to implicit function and calculate its gradient 
This time, it gives you gradient in three dimensions. If you plot this gradient, all you will get is a normal vectors of the surfaces. These vectors are important in surface parameterizations. We will talk more about it later in more detailed concept. Now let's get the idea of line integral of a vector field. Here you can see a boy is trying to push the block along the curve. For that he needs to apply force and push it in certain direction. If you notice, this block will only move along the path of curve if he apply force tangent to curve direction. In some cases, he needs to apply less force to push it, while in some cases he needs to apply more force. If he successfully move the block from point A to point B, then he has done work on it. This work done is calculated by summing up all the magnitude of tangent forces along the length of curve. This summation is done by line integral. It can also be written in more standard form. As a particle moves along a smooth curve in space, the unit tangent vector turns as the curve bends. Its length remains constant and only its direction changes. The unit tangent vector is given by. This can be simplified as. Therefore, the simple definition of work done can be written in vector differential form. Okay, let's visualize work done by this force field on moving an object along the curve parameterized by this equation. The formula to calculate the total work done in moving an object from point A to point B is this line integral. Here F is the force vector of the field. T is unit tangent vector of curve and DS is arc length. Okay, now we need to calculate the force vectors acting on every point of the curve. So let's evaluate the force field only on curve. Notice how its magnitude is randomly distributed along the length of curve. Right now we don't want all the force field. Evaluating force field only on the curve points is enough. Every curve is oriented in space according to their units tangent vectors and normal vectors. To calculate work done, we only need tangential vectors of curve. We can calculate in what direction those units tangent vectors are pointing just by differentiating this parameterized curve. This is simple dot product and it is scalar quantity. Here we are projecting every force vectors in the direction of units tangent vector of curve and multiplying the magnitude of this tangential component of force with the small arc length of curve. This gives small work done on infinitesimal arc length. To calculate the total work done, we need to sum up every tangential component of force field along the length of curve. This is possible only by using integration. Okay, that's some intuitive definition of work done by force field. Now let's look at another example. First, let's get our vector field and parameterized curve. Calculate the force field acting only on curve. Now the definition of work done is. We can convert this equation into parametric vector form. I already told you the relation of these three parameters. Now you can easily calculate total work done by simply using this formula. Just calculate the dot product and integrate from t equals 0 to 1. Okay, work done was an example of line integral of a vector field. Throughout this course, 
you would encounter two types of line integrals line integrals of scalar fields and line integrals of a vector field now let's take a look at the line integral of a scalar field to understand line integral let's understand the basic idea of simple integral first for that i would use a rectangle that has an infinitesimal width and possesses some height to get intuitive meaning of scalar line integral consider an equation of a curve the integral of this curve with respect to x axis is given by this formula it got variable height an infinitesimal width of a small rectangle let's call it a stick right now we only got four stick let's keep on adding them if you do so you approximate the area under this curve just by using 63 sticks you can easily approximate the area the area would be more precise if our stick possesses infinitesimal width and we increase the number of sticks this is also one kind of line integral here we integrate the curve with respect to x axis now let's try to add those sticks on a 2d curve and try to integrate the function here is a parametrized equation of a circle in xy plane now let's plot another curve orthogonal to this circle Yeah every point of this circle is projected upward which builds this beautiful function the line integral of this function along the curve gives the area of this blue surface just imagine adding those tiny stick along the path of a circle now here is an interesting thing if you change this formula's height function to some constant value let's make it 1 then you will get the area of this cylinder In this case every stick got the height 1. Its height is directly proportional to the magnitude of this constant. Okay, here is another curve parametrized in xy plane. Again, let's draw another curve orthogonal to this parametrized curve. See how this curve is parametrized. The line integral of this function, where we add tiny sticks along the parametrized curve in xy plane, gives the area of this surface. Please be careful with the negative area. From the illustration, we see that the graph dips below the xy plane. There is technique to calculate area back in single variable calculus to handle this type of negative and positive function. Now here is an another example, a parametrized ellipse in xy plane. This time let's draw a surface that surrounds this ellipse. As you can see this surface surrounds our ellipse in all way. Let's try to solve this line integral problem. First we need to project our ellipse over the surface. Now the height of stick is given by this parametrized function. Now we don't want the surface, let's remove it. Evaluating this line integral is like adding stick along the path of ellipse that has height generated by this parametrized function. You can convert this problem into this. Did you notice how important parametrizing a curve is? It just makes integral more easier to compute. Here notice the negative area. Be sure to take it into account while calculating the area under this graph. line integral of scalar function along a curve in space is just not clear what such an integral mean but they are good for more than just computing areas consider this spiral curve as a spring 
Let's say the density of this spring varies in space according to this scalar function. Just notice that the density of this spring increases as the spring spirals up the z-axis. If this density function is mass per unit length, then the mass can be calculated by using this formula. Okay, that was some simple example of line integral of scalar fields. Let's get our attention back to the vector field. Throughout this course, we would mostly focus on a vector fields. As you have seen, if you integrate the force vectors along the length of curve, you will obtain the total work done. But what if you integrate velocity vectors along the same curve? In the next section, we will deal with line integral of velocity fields. This brings the new concept of flow and circulation. Now consider a velocity field of wind vectors. In this velocity field, a plane is flying up in the sky. Let's its position in space is given by this position vector. Plotting it, you can see our plane is following a path of a closed curve in 3D space. You can calculate the velocity of this plane by differentiating this position vector. This velocity vector of plane would be tangent to curve. Notice there are two velocity vectors. One velocity vectors of wind. Another velocity of the plane. Now during the flight of this plane, this velocity vector of the wind might helps or hinders the movement of this plane. If the plane travels from point A to point B, Following the path of a curve, then this line integral along the path of a curve measures the flow of wind along the curve. If the flow is positive, then the velocity field helps to push the plane in its direction. And if it's negative, it hinders the movement of plane. You can think of this integral as adding up how helpful or burdensome the wind was during the flight. Now, if this plane follows the path of this closed curve, this same line integral around this closed curve measures the circulation of wind velocity vectors around the curve. It calculates the magnitude of tangential component of wind velocity vectors along the path of curve. Also notice that plane is traveling in counterclockwise direction around this closed curve. So the curve is oriented counterclockwise. Note that circulation does not mean that individual wind particles circle around the boundary of the curve. Rather, the circulation is simply the net result of the flow around the curve. For example, let's isolate tangential velocity vectors of wind acting only on curve. We already knew this integral measures the circulation of wind along the path of plane or curve. Looking at it, you can see, from point A to point B, wind helps to push the plane in its direction. From point B to point C, the help is little less. Now here during the flight from point C to point D, wind hinders its movement. Similarly, it again helps. Now during flight, if the plane rotates at a specific point due to wind vectors, then it's due to the presence of a new vector field called curl. Consider an infinitesimal small sphere which acts at a point in space. It is emerged in a vector field. Under the influence of this field, this sphere will rotate in certain direction with certain magnitude. This rotating sphere indicates the presence of curl in this vector field. 
Curl acts at a point, but not in plane and space, so the consideration of infinitesimal sphere is important. Curl at any specific points in 3D space measures the magnitude and direction of rotation at that point. Since it measures both magnitude and direction, curl itself is a vector quantity. Curl in 3D space is measured with this formula. Notice it is a cross product so the minus sign appears. If you measure the magnitude of curl in the direction of z-axis, then it is called the k-component of curl. It measures how much the sphere rotates in z-axis. The same goes for curl in the direction of x and y axis. Looking at the figure, the k component of curl is much stronger compared to i and j component. A curl is a vector, so it can be resolved into rectangular components. An actual real sphere rotates in a vector field due to the presence of curl field. If the curl field is not constant, then this sphere would rotate randomly throughout different points in space. Now consider this uniform velocity field acting on a plane. We can calculate circulation of vector field around any closed curve by using this line integral. Notice that this curve has covered certain area. Curl is simply circulation per unit area where the area is shrunk to a point and the limit exists. In more general form it is written as Try to measure curl of this vector field, you will get constant curl. It indicates constant rotation about every point in xy plane. Since it is positive, the rotation is counterclockwise. If you put an infinitesimal small wheel or disk in this vector field and fix it at a point, then it will rotate due to curl. The magnitude of rotation in this case is 2. Now consider this shear field of water. Let's calculate the curl at each point of this vector field. The curl is constant and negative here. So a wheel floating on water, undergoing such a shearing flow spins clockwise. The rate of rotation is same at each point. Here is another vector field. A uniform expansion. The curl is zero here. This means the gas is not circulating at very small scales. Ok now we can compute circulation and curl. Now, if our line integral happens to be into dimensions, then Green's theorem applies and we can use Green's theorem as an alternative way to calculate the line integral of this same curve. Green's theorem transforms the line integral around the closed curve into a double integral over the region inside our curve. First, think of this integral as the macroscopic circulation of the vector field around the path of our curve. Now, imagine you came up with a microscopic version of circulation around a curve. In this case, this microscopic circulation is curl. We could picture this microscopic circulation or curl as a bunch of small closed curves where each curve represents the tendency for the vector field to circulate at that location. Green's theorem says that if you add up all the microscopic circulation inside our curve, then that total is exactly the same as the macroscopic circulation around the curve. Here, D is the interior of the curve C. Now in closed curve instead of tangential component, if you sum up every normal component of velocity field, then what you get is flux. The flux calculates the rate at which a fluid is entering or leaving a region enclosed by a closed curve. By this flux formula, we can get the flow across curve. Here, you can see, fluid particles just expands from certain point. The point where fluid particles expands or compressed 
is the point of divergence. Divergence is microscopic, while flux is macroscopic. Divergence is occurred when flux is shrunk to zero or shrunk to a point. It can be also called as flux density. You can get divergence of any vector field by using this formula. I hope you notice the difference between divergence and flux. They are closely related. So divergence occurs on point, whereas flux occurs across the curve. In Green's theorem, there is a relation between divergence and flux. You can calculate total flux across a curve by summing up every divergence enclosed by that curve. Consider again this uniform expansion of velocity field of a gas or liquid. Now, consider a point in this velocity field. If you measure divergence at this point, it would be positive. Let us draw more velocity field near its location. Okay, let's close this point by a circle. Now look at this vector diagram, the flow out of the circle is more than flow into the circle. Since flow out is more than flow in, the flux would be positive. So in this case, both divergence at this point and flux out of this circle is positive. Now, consider an infinite small fluid material. In this velocity field, this fluid material will expand. As it moves through this velocity field, so its volume increases. Do you know why it expands? Here, yeah, the velocity out is greater, so this side of fluid element stretch more. But the flow in is smaller, so it would compress less. Overall, the volume of this fluid element increases. But if this is an uniform compression velocity field, then the fluid particle will be compressed and the volume decreases. You have seen in line integral how curve in space is parametrized to a single t-axis. Just like that we will learn how to parametrize a 3D surface into a plane. Okay, our goal right now is to find a double integral formula for calculating the area of this sphere based on the parametrization. Okay. If you partial differentiate this parametrization with respect to u and v axis, then geometrically it can be represented in terms of tangent vectors. For instance, if v is held constant, then this parametrization is a vector valued function of a single parameter and defines a curve that lies on the surface of our sphere. Its partial derivative is tangent to our surfaces. The same goes if u is held constant. Now take any point in the UV plane. This point can be mapped to a point in surface in 3D space. The partial derivative at that point can be found, which is a vector. Notice these two unit tangent vectors creates a plane which is tangent to our surface. Now in UV plane, at that point, take a tiny infinitesimal piece of rectangle. The length and width of this rectangle can be mapped to our unit tangent vectors of our surfaces. Now take the cross product of these two vectors. What will you get? The cross product of these two vectors is another vector perpendicular to this plane. So this new vector is perpendicular to our surfaces. The magnitude of this new vector is area of this parallelogram. And the area of this parallelogram can be nearly approximated with the area of this infinitesimal small surface. 
or the area of this curved patch element. That's the area for one patch element. Now, in order to calculate the total area of this whole patch of sphere, we need to sum up every rectangle of this UV plane. This summation is done by double integral. So, if you integrate the area of this rectangle, you get the area of this sphere. You can use this formula to calculate surface area of an parametrized 3D surface. But many times you would encounter a surface which are not parametrized. The other surface you will encounter will either be an explicit or an implicit function. If a surface is in implicit form, you can use this formula, or if a surface is in explicit form, then you can use this formula to calculate surface area. If you understand, really understand, how to use these three formulas, then one thing is for sure, you can easily master the vector calculus course. In Stokes' theorem, divergence theorem, and computing surface integrals, computing these differential patch element is very important. Once you understand how it is obtained, calculation would be very easy. I have showed how this parametrized formula has arrived, now, it's your homework to understand the derivation of these two formulas. If you understand the derivation of this parametrized surface area, then understanding these two is quite easy. Now, let's understand how to use these three formulas. Let's use these tools on finding the surface area of this paraboloid, which is cut by a plane Z is equal to 4 in space. First, sketch the surface. This is an explicit function. Looking at our formula sheet, we can use this formula for calculating surface area. Now, partial differentiate this explicit function with respect to x and then with respect to y. Then the surface area is given by this double integration. Now, in order to find the region R, project this paraboloid in the x, y plane, which is circle of radius 2. Now, just double integrate over the region of this circle, you will get the area of this paraboloid. Now, let's solve this same problem using parametrization method. You will soon see that the area would be same. First, parametrize the parabola. Now, partial differentiate it. Now calculate the cross product of these two vectors. Now, we require the magnitude of their cross product. Finally integrate this magnitude over the circle. The answer would be same. Now, let's solve this same problem using the implicit method. First, convert this explicit function to implicit function. Now, compute its gradient. Therefore, the magnitude of gradient is. Now, you need to find the unit P vector. If you project this paraboloid into X, Z plane, then unit P vector is equal to unit J vector. But the projection is not one to one and you can't double integrate over this region. There is another way you can project it on x, y plane, then the projection is 1 to 1. In this case, unit p vector is equal to unit k vector, which is normal to our circle. Now, calculate the magnitude of gradient in the direction of unit k vector. Finally, double integrate over the circle the area would be same. Now, we can calculate the area of any surface by summing up each of these tiny patches of surfaces. If the surface is parametrized, then we can unwrap the surface into a UV axis and double integrate the area of this plane. 
or if the surface is not parametrized, then we can convert it to an implicit function, project the function into the plane, capturing its gradient vectors, and compute the area by this formula. In both cases, we evaluated the surface area. Now, if you integrate a functions over the area of a surface, then what you are computing is surface integrals. For example, you might want to compute mass at each point on the surface, and if the mass per unit area on each point of a surface is given by this equation, then evaluating this surface integral gives the total mass of this object. This is a scalar function. In this chapter, we will focus mostly on surface integral of a vector field. Now, imagine a fluid with velocity field flowing through a surface. Now think of this surface as imaginary surface, which doesn't impede the fluid flow. Like a fishing net across a stream. If f vector represents the velocity field, n vector represents the unit normal, then the mass perpendicular to surface per unit time at an infinite small point is where rho is density at that point. This is interpreted physically as a rate of mass flow through an infinitesimal small surface. Now the flux of mass of the fluid flowing across the entire surface per unit of time is the surface integral of a vector field. The orientation of unit normal vectors is very important. If unit normal vectors points in opposite direction, then we will be off by minus 1. So, we can calculate the surface integral of any vector field by using this formula. We already know how to calculate this differential patch element of a surface. But how do we calculate unit normal vector of a surface? You might encounter three types of surface, a parametrized surface, an implicit surface, or an explicit surface. For parametrized surface, the cross product of their partial derivatives gives a new vector perpendicular to their surface, so the unit normal vector for parametrized surface can be calculated by using this formula. Similarly, for an implicit function, their gradient vectors are perpendicular to surface, so the unit vector can be calculated using this formula. And finally, for an explicit surface, you can convert it to an implicit surface and calculate the unit normal. In the next episode, we will evaluate the surface integral of a vector field. Let's calculate the outward flux of vector field through this surface, which is cut from the cylinder by these planes. We can find the flux by this surface integral. First, let's find the differential patch element of our surface. Since this is implicit function, we can calculate the area of this surface by using this formula. Comparing these two, we can see the differential patch element is. It requires gradient of our implicit function. Ok, now calculate the gradient of this implicit surface. Now, project the surface into the xy plane with its gradient vector. The unit p vector would be equal to k vector. Now calculate the differential patch element of our surface. Now, let's get the normal orientation of our surface. It seems the vectors are directed outward from the surface, so we want the normal that points in outward direction. Now we need the vector field that acts on our surface. It seems both unit normal and vector field points in same direction, so the magnitude of flux in this case would be higher. Ok, we captured surface patch elements and vectors in the direction of unit normal. Now evaluate the double integral over the region of this rectangle to get the total flux. Now, Stokes' theorem generalized the circulation curl form of Green's theorem to third dimensions. It relates the circulation of a vector field around the boundary C of an oriented surface S in space 
to a surface integral over the surface s. We also require that the surface to be piecewise smooth. Now, slice this surface in half and name the boundaries of the two resulting pieces. You can see these curves are oriented in counterclockwise direction. If they are each oriented the same way which our main curve was, then the line integrals around each of these smaller curves cancel out along the slice that you made. The portions of curve C1 and C2 which remains, make up the original boundary C. So the sum of the line integrals around the smaller pieces equals the full line integral around our original curve C. More generally, imagine slicing up these surface into many, many really small pieces and orient them all the same way. The line integrals around all of these little loops will cancel out along the slices within C, leaving only something equal to the line integral around C itself. Now consider a circle in space. Consider the orientation of this circle to be counterclockwise. Let the vector fields around the boundary of circle also rotates counterclockwise. You can calculate the total circulation of vector fields around this circle by using this formula. If this circle is closed by a smooth paraboloid in 3D space, then according to Stokes' theorem, this circulation integral can be converted to curl integral. In Stokes' theorem, the orientation of surface is very important. You have two possible choices, either normal vectors points inward, or it might point outward. The curve's orientation should follow the right-hand rule, in the sense that, if you stick the thumb of your right hand, in the direction of a unit normal vector, near the edge of the surface, and curl your fingers, the direction they point on the curve should match its orientation. Here, yeah, the orientation of curled fingers matches with the orientation of circle, so this is the right orientation of unit normal vectors. All of them must point outwards. But, if the circle is oriented counterclockwise in space, and the unit normal vectors points outwards, then the direction of finger is in opposite with the direction of circle. So, in this case the normal vectors must points inward. It is also possible that two different oriented surface can process the same boundary. Here, yeah, the lower boundary is cone, whereas the upper boundary is paraboloid. In both cases these integrals are same. These both curl integrals equal the counterclockwise circulation integral on the left side of this equation as long as the unit normal vectors correctly orient the surfaces. Just notice the correct orientation of unit normal vectors of cone and paraboloid. Now, let's find out the circulation of this 3D vector field around this circle in space. This circle boundary is closed by a cone having this parametrized equation. This circle has radius to unit and it lies above xy plane at z is equal to 2. You can calculate circulation of this vector field around this curve by using this formula. Solving this integral requires a lot of work. Try solving it, you will get the answer of 4 pi. There is also another way. You can convert this line integral to curl integral and integrate the curl field over the surface of this cone. Let's solve the surface integral for the cone. But for that, first we need to get the normal vectors of cone. Since our circle is oriented counterclockwise, so according to our sign convention, the unit vectors must be oriented in this way. Now, get the surface patch element. 
Now, get the differential equation of curl vector field. Now, compute curl in the direction of unit normal vector, which is dot product. Finally, integrate this magnitude of dot product over the surface of our cone. The answer would be 4 pi. The cone used in this example is not the easiest surface to use. Instead, we can use the flat disk of radius 2 centered on the z-axis. As the surface and circle lies in the plane, we can use Green's theorem to calculate this line integral. Here, the normal vector to the surface would be unit k vector. Now, we still have the differential curl field. However, this component would be equal to 1. So, evaluating this surface integral would be equal to finding the area of this circle, which is 4 pi. This result agrees with the, our previous circulation value. Similarly, the divergence of vector fields in third dimensions is written as Now if you integrate every of these divergences inside the domain of this closed 3D surface, then the integration will be equivalent to flux of same vector fields crossing across this closed surface. Remember, the points of divergence lies in 3D space. That's why we use the triple integrals.